May it please your Lordship and uh, your Ladyships. Um, Authorities Bundle 5, tab 49, I was going to refer you to the Hossetig decision, and in particular uh, the questions which were put to the court by the Hungarian court. And one finds those set out at uh, pages 1668, uh, Attorney General, uh, Advocate General uh, 23, uh, and it goes on over the page to 1669. Um, and while I request the court to read those, can I summarize it in, in, the, in the following way? The, the, the primary argument which was being advanced by the Hungarian party was that um, it could rely on Rome 1 uh, and Rome 1 uh, allowed it to say, well, as a matter of Hungarian law, never mind French law or European law, these terms and conditions are not incorporated. So that was its primary argument. Its secondary argument, um, <clears throat> which uh, was scarcely uh, more uh, attractive, was this. The jurisdiction clause identified the courts of the city of Paris as the, uh, the situs for where these disputes were going to be determined. And Hostig's position was, well, as a matter of European law, that's not good enough because Paris isn't a state. There is the obvious point that, of course, Paris is within a state, but never mind. That was its argument. Um, and essentially, you see uh, the Advocate General um, encapsulated the essence of what was being asked of the uh, European court in paragraph 27 uh, of his opinion, and that's on page 1670. And he said what the referring court in essence seeks to ascertain is whether Article 23 of Regulation 44 precludes a clause conferring jurisdiction included in the general conditions of contract of one of the parties, according to which disputes between the parties would be subject to the exclusive and final jurisdiction of the courts of a particular town or city of a member state, in this case, the city of Paris. It's this question. I propose should be replied to by the court. So you'll see immediately that the actually the question which was referred to the court in connection with Article 23, at least the Attorney Gen the Advocate General's interpretation of that, was much narrower than what I read to you as appearing in Mr. Beard's uh, skeleton argument, or indeed the skeleton argument of his predecessor, Mr. Ritchie. So um, the, this case plainly didn't raise the consideration by the uh, European Court. Uh, the question which had arisen in Salotti, for example, because there was no doubt but that the terms had been supplied from at the very beginning by Technos. It did not answer the question, what would happen if uh, the Hungarian party, Hossig, had signed an acknowledgement that the contract was to be um, uh, on the general standard in terms of conditions or technos, but those those um, hadn't been supplied because that question wasn't a live question before. Um, now, Mr. Beard has sh has shown the court what it is that the, the court said um, in, uh, in, in on this, and of course he relies heavily on what it is that the, the court said in paragraphs thirty nine and forty of, of its. Judgment on paragraph 1682. Um, but uh, <clears throat> as I've said, the issue with which we're concerned, which the judge was concerned in this case, simply didn't arise for um, decision. And that's clear from the, uh, the facts of the case. Furthermore, the reference by the European Court to the decision in profit investment in our submission shows that the court wasn't purporting to lay down a generally applicable rule because it had previously ruled in our submission when, we, when, when you construe what was decided in profit investment, it had previously decided in the situation which is analogous to our case and indeed was analogous to the case uh, of Technos, that where a party had uh, uh, expressly accepted in writing the applicability of general conditions of another party that was satisfactory as far as Article 23 is concerned. And we say that's what you can derive from the decision of the European Court in profit investment. And as I said, we submit that the learned judge was correct in his interpretation of the profit investment case. Now, where does that leave this court? In our submission, um, 
where that leaves this court is that it should follow a consistent line of settled authority which stretches back to 1997. And it should not conclude that, in, in essence, that settled line of authority in the way of approaching um, the Article 23 issue in a commercial case should be set aside by a sidewind by a case in which the issue didn't actually arise. Now, if, if the court was against me on what uh, Hossig actually decides, then, of course, the court is confronted by, by um, uh, the proposition that Mr. Beard puts forward. Well, you should simply follow Hossig and disregard uh, the 25 years of jurisprudence in this court. In our submission, that's not the way in which this court should proceed. Um, and we've set out in our um, skeleton argument reference to a number of cases, which uh, I'm not going to take the court to in the interests of time. But um, there are three decisions. There's a decision called Condé Nast, which I think my learned friend re refers to and relies on. That's the decision of the Court of Appeal. Where in your skeleton do you refer to these matters? Um, paragraphs 25 to 26, my lady. Thank you. Um, Condé Nast is a case which my learned friend referred to. Uh, the judgment of Lord, the court consisted of Lord Justice Chadwick, uh, Lady Justice Orden, and one other whose name escapes me for the moment. Lord Justice Chadwick in that case assumed that, there, that, uh, the, um, that this court could depart from a previous decision of its own in circumstances where essentially it was clearly inconsistent, or there were strong grounds for believing it was inconsistent with a later judgment of the European Court. But on the facts of that case, um, uh, the, the court decided not to depart from previous decisions of its own. So it, although there was an assumption that the, uh, there was such a principle in the result, the court didn't, um, didn't feel feel that it was appropriate to depart from uh, its previous line of authority. Is and, the phrase used clearly inconsistent? Uh, I'm not, I think I'm para paraphrasing right, it. Okay. Let me get you, get your lady. Don't worry, we, we'll, we'll, if it's there, it's there, we'll find it. Thank you. Um, there is a later decision of the, uh, the Court of Appeal called um, uh, Act Tavis and, uh, uh, let me find it. Come on, it's O'Byrne and Event, it's 2008, one weekly. Which is an authorities bundle of one, tab six, page 77. That was another case where the court did not depart uh, from its previous decision. And what it said um, uh, in, that, uh, in that case, at paragraph 35 of the judgment, assuming such a principle to exist, it could only apply if the previous decision of this court were clearly inconsistent with the decision of the Court of Justice. And that is, that is, those, I'm not paraphrasing, those are the words which were used. Paragraph 35 of the judgment of the court uh, in that case. Having examined the reasoning of the court and the judgment of the court in that case, uh, it decided that it wasn't in fact inconsistent with the earlier decision uh, and it should follow its earlier decision. Perhaps more pertinently, there is a decision of this court in a case called that Tarvis and Merck, uh, which is an authorities bundle uh, one at tab eight. Um, which concerned um, a, 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 a concern, uh, question relating to patents. And um, Lord Justice Jacobs, perhaps not surprisingly, gave the judgment of the court. And um, the Court of Appeal held in that case that there was a specialist in very limited exception <coughs> to Young and Bristol uh, aeroplane and its judgment at paragraph um, 107. And it, it said at paragraph 95, that it was free to decide what the court should do if it found its earlier interpretation of European law for the grant of patents was, as it put it, clearly inconsistent with a settled interpretation given by the Boards of Appeal of the European Patent Office. So it recognised that there was a potential exception to Young and Bristol Aeroplane, but only where its decision was clearly inconsistent with a settled interpretation. Now, in our submission, even if one gets to this stage, PIFS can't satisfy this court that its earlier decisions, this court's earlier decisions, are clearly inconsistent with a settled interpretation of European law, not least 
because the issue with which we are concerned in this case simply didn't arise. And so this would not be an appropriate case for this court to recognise a further exception to the principle of stare decisis. Now, um, moving on slightly, um, even if we're wrong about all of this, we rely on the judge's judgment at paragraphs 164 to 167, for bundle 2, tab 23, page 381, where the judge said, essentially, well, even if I'm wrong um, about the, the incorporation uh, of the, uh, the formal validity of these, case, these clauses because the parties specifically in their account opening documents accepted their application, even if I'm wrong about that, in fact, in 2012, uh, these terms were supplied to uh, this. Um, and there were two routes to the, uh, the conclusion formal validity that the, the learned judge adopted in those paragraphs. But importantly, he recognised that after that date, uh, PIFS opened a further 12 accounts with Bank Picte after the 18th of May 2012, on each occasion signing account opening documents, um, which uh, incorporated the general business conditions. So in our, su in our submission, uh, PIF's consent to the jurisdiction clauses were plainly uh, established uh, at that stage, <coughs> even if not at an earlier stage. And PIF's uh, agreed, when it, um, when it agreed to those general business conditions, that those conditions should apply to all of its existing business relationships with um, PICTE. And there is nothing... There's nothing as a matter of formal validity of European law which pro prohibits that, precludes that. It's perfectly entitled. Parties are perfectly entitled to say, well, I agree now that my general business conditions will apply to all the business relationships which we have. But I'm afraid you, you're losing me. I'm sorry about that. It's my fault. So um, this, is this not a scope argument? This is why I query... No, this is not a scope agreement. argument. Right. So, well, sorry. Sorry. So It's an incorporate... It's a formal validity argument. Right. Which hasn't, which my, my learned friend didn't. Is, is this a respondent's notice? Is this a, what is this? It's not a respondent's notice, because right. this, is a, this is a decision by the judge, which my learned friend didn't um, address in his uh, oral submissions. Okay, and you address this in your skeleton argument where? We address it in our skeleton argument, uh, paragraphs 27 to 28. I'm reminded by Mr. And I'm looking at paragraph 166 of the judgment. 164 to 167, yes. 164 right. to 167. Well, he says this is a question of scope, and he goes back well, to 281. Um, me... That's why I queried. I didn't I'm understand. Sorry. I didn't understand. Yeah. Um, 1.3 of the... Uh, Isn't it 164 where he says, even if my first mm. conclusion is incorrect? Yes. That's right. The election's right. I'm sorry, I gave you, giving the court wrong right, record. Just slow down from... Uh, so secondly, 164. Yes. And 165, my lady. Well, that's the sec another point. That's, that's a... Which leads into what I call the scope. Point. Yes, it does lead... It unquestionably leads into the scope issue. But if we're talking about formal validity, wasn't there agreement in writing? then plainly, yes, there was an agreement. And the second one doesn't take you anywhere without the third one. Um, so the second one goes, of course, when they're supplied, it's common ground yes. that the conditions um, kick in as yes. of that point when they are communicated. Yes. correct. Well, so far, so good. Yes. But it's only with the scope argument... Yes, correct. ...that you get anywhere. That, I agree. So... I agree. Tell me what 1.3 in the list of issues is tilting at. Hmm. Because I, I, that, to my mind, is yeah. a misreading of what the judge was finding... Um, which is, he was simply, it, it, it's, or, or what is, is 1.3 directed at 164, the judgment? Hmm. I don't know what it's. <coughs> uh, <coughs> well. I mean, clearly, in a sense, well, everybody agrees, and Mr. Beard rightly accepts, that once they're communicated, even on his case, they yes. are incorporated. Correct. Then the only question is, so that's not an issue. No. The judge didn't hold anything to the contrary. 
Oh. I thought the point of contention was 166, which to my mind is a scope argument. And I, I, that's how the judge addressed it. Yeah, I, I respectfully agree with the Lady that is a scope argument. But, okay. So the question is, when you agree at that stage, yes. are you agreeing to everything, all of your relationships being included in those general conditions, or only your relationship going forward? Well, the judge says, as a matter of domestic law construction, yes. see later at 281 in particular, Yes. the clauses go back. So to my mind, that's... Anyway. Well, that, that's... that's a anyway, scope. you rely on that one way or the other wherever it comes into your yes, argument. Yes, I do. Um, now, there is um, a respondent's notice point, which I'm going to uh, touch on lightly, given the, the time and given what I've said I will cover um, this afternoon. And that relates... Sorry, so obviously time is important, but it's important also that we properly understand this point. So, if you get to this stage, you say, well, it's all cured because of the judge's construction yes. of the general clauses that were delivered in 2012. Yes. Now, just remind me, um, do the, does PIFS challenge this? <coughs> yes. The PIFS challenges this construction? Yes. And Sorry, you say it was right? Yes. Um, and why do you say it was right? Um, because when you, when you look at those general business, I think the, the we go, go back to see. Uh, this is a, this is a question. Well, well, look, we're addressing now, my lady, the question of scope scope issue. So there's an issue of Swiss law. Yes. Which the learned judge uh, made his findings. Made his findings, um, and as a matter of Swiss law, he accepted that jurisdiction clauses, which were expressed in broad terms, should be construed broadly. And I paraphrase what he says in. Uh, right. Uh, it's paragraph 281 is where he, re he rests on this issue. Yes, I think that's right. Right. And in fairness to Mr Beard, I think he, he challenges this in his Scoven argument. He does. He does. Although he said nothing about it all. Right. No, I'm not criticising him for, for that. Um, I see. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we I, rest. And somebody will have to tell me what 1.3 on the list of issues means if I haven't correctly identified. I'll see if I can, um, yeah. I, I can uh, illuminate that. Thank you. Right. Um, respondent's notice point, um, even if all this is wrong, was the judge correct to conclude that the terms and conditions weren't supplied um, at the outset? Uh, and his, his reasoning on this was purely inferential. And so we say this court is in as good a position as the judge was to make the proper inferences in circumstances where the evidence was that it was general practice to supply general business conditions at an initial business meeting. Well, now, and he, he yeah, refers yeah, that... Yes, up, up, up to a point, but... Sorry, um, it's, it, it's his inferences that we're concerned with. It it's is. Not, it's not good enough, is it, to say that we're in as good a position uh, as he is simply because it depends no, you're, on you're, documents. Um, uh, the question for us is not what we think, but um, what we think of what he... He did. Your, your lordship's right. I agree with that. Um, but it, you, the court has to consider what the, what the state of the evidence was. That's right. But I mean, you're going to have to show us that he reached a wrong inference, not just that. No, I agree. We, we might have reached a different one. No, I agree. I entirely agree. Okay. First of all, the evidence the, there wasn't much evidence about this, given that um, uh, the original account had been closed back in yeah, 19. Well, I can see the bar is getting higher for you by the moment. <laughs> <laughs> There isn't much evidence that he reaches an inference. Uh, well, the question is, what did what? Just what help me where he is in the judgment as well. Uh, this is uh, paragraph 160. Mm -hmm. um, yes. <coughs> sorry, I, 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 I don't want to interrupt your flow, but no, my I just want to make sure that we're embarking upon the right exercise. Yeah, absolutely. <coughs> and I'm going to try and take it as quickly as possible because I've got other uh, yes. other important fish to fry. Um, so. Usual practice, the evidence is usual practice that these <coughs> terms and conditions are supplied at the outset. And all that we have to set against that usual practice is the suggestion, well, it might not have been applied in this case because the relationship between um, Mr. Alrojan, Mr. Bertrand, uh, and others was an improper relationship. 
Okay. That doesn't lead to an inference that they would have been more or less likely to, um, to, to be uh, well, in, well, indeed. And the, re and the reason that that is important is if one looks at paragraph 171 of his judgment. And we're going moving from 160 to 171. 171, where he's dealing with Picte Europe, admittedly not Bonk Picte. What, do you see, what one sees there is that as far as the Luxembourg Bank is concerned, it did supply its terms back in 2000 to um, uh, PIS. So if and insofar as the judge was saying, well, because the relationship was an improper one, as he seems to have been saying <coughs> earlier in relation to the um, PICTE conditions, this shows that there was absolutely no reason why, if there was an improper relationship, those terms and conditions would not have been supplied. So did you say proper or improper relationship? Improper relationship. That's what the judge is saying. Essentially. Where, Where in? Um, that is. Sorry. I read what? him as saying that it's One, five, quite... nine. See, one sees, he says, well, it may not have been followed in the present case since the account was open in the context. Nothing improper. Yeah. Well, no. In the context of a pre existing relationship. Well, it's a good point, isn't it? Well, you know, if, if, you're, if you already have established relationships, you may not follow your general practice. Um, well, they didn't have an established banking relationship. No. Uh, at least that's not the pleaded case. Um, I'm, I'm anxious to move on. I know, um, but over by, I'm striking improper. I'm just saying we should go away, read this, and uh, ask ourselves whether or not this, the reasoning of the judge was obviously untenable. Obviously untenable. Uh, yes. Right. I agree. Now, can I then turn to the question of material validity? And at the outset of my submissions, I, uh, I mentioned uh, four questions four points which are relevant to the Article 23 uh, issue. Um, what are the disputes between the parties? Uh, was there an agreement in writing? We're at the stage now where we, we're beyond the um, formal validity point, so we're either right or wrong about that, but let's assume we're right about that. Do the disputes fall within the scope of the jurisdiction clause as a matter of Swiss law? Uh, and the judge has decided that, and it's not been challenged by uh, Pips. And that leads to the fourth question. Fourth question, and does this dispute arise in connection with a particular legal relationship uh, in connection with which the jurisdiction clauses were agreed? And the answer to that is, yes, plainly it does. And the dis disputes arise, my lady, in connection with a banker-customer relationship between uh, Pictae and PIFs, under which PIFs was receiving investment services, financial services, forgive me, financial services from Bank Pictae. And the approach which the learned judge adopted in our submission displayed no error of law uh, and, and, and displayed a proper understanding of the <coughs> connection between the jurisdiction clauses and the legal relationships which existed between the parties. Could one look at, please, at um, the pleading, which you'll find in Core Bundle 3. Um, at tab 31. And at paragraph 22, one sees encapsulated what the relationship between these parties was. At all material times, Picte provided financial services to PIFs. <clears throat> now, that is reinforced if one... And this is why there's the big bust up on, on which pleading to refer to, because this has now been deleted. Uh, it's been amended. Right, okay. I can't tell you precisely how it's been amended. Um, 
Anyway, but anyway, it's common ground. We, these are the ones that we have to look at for the purpose. These are the ones argument. we should look at. These are the ones before the learned judge. And if you turn on uh, in the pleading to paragraph thirty, um, and um, one sees Piff's relies on some specific schemes. Each scheme enjoyed its particular features. In general, the schemes at core operated as follows, and they give a number of features which they say were common to these schemes. And if you just look at paragraphs A, B, and C for the moment, you'll see that uh, the scheme is said, under the control or influence of our regime, PIFs made decisions in Kuwait to enter into arrangements for the provision of financial services for PIFs and to make investments um, and the investment capital typically being provided by this bank account. And what uh, paragraph are we on? That's 30A, subparagraph A, at page, one, uh, page 603. Fees were payable on financial services um, supplied to it or investments which it entered into. And C, Mr. Raoul Rajan procured the banks and investment companies with whom he was dealing on behalf of PIFs in his capacity as Director General to make secret commissions to him, equating to an agreed proportion of the relevance. What's this stop, Stuart? I mean, the, 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 these are particulars of schemes. Yes, um, which every scheme shared, so they said. But if these are dishonest schemes. That's what they say, yes. Yes, but I mean, I, I take your point about the generic statement that um, yes. you provided financial services. Yes. But, um, the, 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 this, speaking for myself, doesn't help me at all as to what the business relationship was or what the um, materiality is, I mean, but, the details of the schemes. No, I'm, what I'm seeking to do is to show the court that the disputes with which we are concerned arise in connection with the particular legal relationships. That's what I'm seeing. That, that, so you're focused on dispute. Yes, at the moment I'm focused on dispute. Not. What is the dispute between <laughs> the parties? Uh, and the dispute between the parties arises in connection with the provision of financial services over a whole host of accounts. Now, I, I'm planning to show the court briefly uh, the relevant <coughs> extract from the pleaded case. And rather than uh, go through it in the pleadings, I can ask the court to look at uh, the specific paragraphs of the judgment. So, so is your point that you're saying that the, the, um, the legal relationship is much broader than mere account activity? Yes. Whichever way you look at it, the disputes relate to more than account activity. Correct. And the, and, and the bank, therefore, the relevant relationship is the wider banking Correct. customer. Correct. So it's either way, yes. And one, see, and one sees that in, in terms of the way in which this is pleaded. It starts with an initial account relationship on which administration fees were being paid. I think that's <coughs> paragraph 173 of the pleading, which one sees in the, um, the learned judge's judgment at paragraph 50. Um, further to the discussions, in about early August, uh, as is evidenced by an internal dictate memory, it was agreed by Mr. Bertrand and Mr. Rajan, the latter would receive a commission of 0.125% uh, of the administrative fees withheld by Pitt Pay on PIF's account, number 99501. Now, um, account number 99501 was in fact opened um, by the end of the second quarter, according to the pleaded case. That's uh, uh, paragraph 171 of the pleading, which is not referred to in the, in the judgment. So, what is, what, what's, what's being said here is that an account was opened um, and um, secret commissions were agreed to be paid in relation to that account, it, uh, calculated with reference to the administrative fees which were payable. And what one sees when one reads on in the learned judge's judgment is that there were um, uh, further services were agreed, further accounts were opened, um, if one looks at paragraph 53 of his judgment at the bottom of page 340, in April 1999, Piss opened a further account authorised by Mr. Raoul Jean, which was the first of many accounts opened by Piss to pay on which global custody and brokerage fees were charged. And then, uh, as the judge referred to over the page on page 341, thereafter, and at all material times, the Pictet group provided services to Piss in roles as investment manager, custodian, 
a nominee across a range of investments through accounts with Pictet, administered in Switzerland in Luxembourg through Pictet Europe. Mr. Alrojan was at all time, material times the main contact for Pictet at PIFS. He signed requests to open accounts with PIFS and an individual signing authority without limit. And if one turns on all the way to um, paragraph 194 of the pleading, which one sees in 342, between 1999 and 2015, <coughs> pursuant to the above arrangements, the total sum of approximately 26.7 million was paid by those secret commissions in respect of financial services provided by Pictet and PIFS and procured or authorised by Mr. Albert Jean. The table summarising the investments and the commissions generated in respect of the appendix is Appendix 3. So, um, the point I'm making there is that the disputes which uh, PIFS have pleaded, and which are the only disputes which one needs to consider for the purposes of this jurisdiction analysis, are um, uh, disputes about the services which were provided by PICTE as banker to PIFS, the financial services which um, resulted, the expanding services which resulted and an expanding number of accounts. Now, so what what Piff says, at least uh, in writing, is that there was insufficient proximity between the uh, alleged bribery claims and the legal relationships uh, out of which uh, those. Uh, bribes are said to have arisen uh, and insufficient proximity to satisfy the requirements of Article 23. But we suggest that there's an air of unreality about that central proposition that objectively PIFs would be taken by surprise by being required to sue a Swiss bank in Switzerland to recover alleged secret commissions, which in its own case were paid with reference to accounts um, which uh, it was that which it opened as a result of um, commissions paid secretly to its own agent. In our submission, when one looks properly at the pleading, as the learned judge did in these paragraphs, contrary to Piff's submissions that the accounts were unimportant, the accounts are front and center of the relationship which existed between the parties. Now, my learned friend yesterday in response to questions from the court, accepted that it didn't matter whether you describe this the, the, the relationship between Piffs and Picte as 96 relationships or 100 relationships or a single relationship <coughs> pursuant to which a whole load of services were provided. Um, and if, if that's right, which we say it is right, um, that's, the, that's the end of this argument in our submission because it is quite clear that as a matter of uh, uh, independent autonomous law, parties are uh, in quite entitled to adopt broad um, jur jurisdiction clauses in relation to their relationships. What one sees when one, when one drills down uh, to all of this is that Piff's case has become, has become this, um, that dispute didn't fall, this dispute doesn't fall within Article 23 because there's some principle of European law which says that claims which weren't foreseen by the parties at the time of contracting, such as fraud claims or bribery claims, can never be covered by a broadly worded ECJ, EJC unless it's expressly referred to in the contract. Now, in our submission, that would be a remarkable and completely unjustified proposition which finds no support in the wording of Article 23 or any of the relevant jurisprudence, it would undermine the principles of legal certainty and party autonomy on which Article 23 is built, since all a claimant would need to do in order to escape from the uh, party's agreed jurisdiction clause would be to allege fraud or some other unseen event and with one bound the party would be free. That, in my submission, is not uh, a proposition which can be derived from uh, the European case law. And it has, just think about it for a moment, if one, if one would, um, the Brussels 
Convention regime, which uh, antedates uh, the Lugano Convention by a number of years, has been around for about 50 years, since 1968. And um, there's not a hint in the jurisprudence that a broadly drafted jurisdiction clause is incapable, as a matter of Article 23, of covering a claim for alleged bribery or alleged fraud. And that would, that would be astonishing if, that had to, uh, if this was the first case in which such a proposition uh, was established. And in my submission, when one comes to look and read uh, carefully what, what was said in CDC and what was said in the Apple sales case, particularly the explanation of the CDC <coughs> case given by the Advocate General uh, in the Apple sales case, one sees that there is simply no warrant for the proposition for which my learned friend uh, contains. Um, now, um, I've already shown the court uh, the, the plea of the case, and fortunately I can now skip over that. Um, there is one, one final uh, paragraph in the pleading I should perhaps show the court before moving on, and that is paragraph 354 of my learned friend's plea, which one finds in core bundle 3, tab 31, page 720. Uh, and the judge referred to this, I think, in, the, in, in judgment 310. Further, in the alternative, PIFS is entitled to compensation in the value of the secret submission. Would you want us to, to read 354? Uh, most of all, please read 354 before we get to subparagraph A. All right, so thank you. Before we get to that, um, we're on um, page 720. Yes, my lady. So before we get to what, read this and then what? Um, read paragraph 354, the pleading. I only made the point that it's referred to also by the learned judge. judge makes the point in paragraph 310, my lady, of his judgment, core bundle 2, page, uh, tab 23, page 429, that although the relief here is not contractual relief, its connection with the contractual relationships between PIFs and Banque Pite is clear. So um, what, what is being said? in paragraph 354 of the plea is that as a result of the um, alleged improper payments, PIFS paid too much for the services from which, which it derived from uh, Bon Pite. And that is obviously, and uh, without the possibility of contradiction in my submission, a claim which clearly arises in connection as the closest connection with uh, the, uh, the legal relationships into which the parties enter, and in connection with which uh, jurisdiction clauses were agreed. This is um, one of a series of remedies. Yes, it's one of a series it's of remedies. one of the remedies, but it's not the only one. It's not the only one. We start to be at 351. Yes, the point I'm making, my lord, is this, that if you are asking whether these disputes uh, arise in connection with uh, the uh, legal relationships into which these parties entered, the only answer is obviously they do. There is the closest possible connection. As I've said, in judgment paragraph 284, the learned judge identifies the nub of his claim and that is that its agent, Mr. al Fajan, caused it to enter into contractual relationship uh, with uh, my clients, Mon Pite, in return for alleged secret permission. Now, that, that itself has the plainest connection with the underlying legal relationship. Um, and this paragraph 354 is just icing on the cake. 
Now, now, so that's what the disputes are about. That's their connection with the legal relationship between the parties. The judge directed himself in reference to uh, the leading case, which is the Powell Dufferin case. Um, and he also referred to uh, CDC uh, and Apple sales, as well as the judgment of Mr. Justice Jacob in, um, uh, in the Etihad case. Now, um, he referred to the Powell Dufferin case in his uh, judgment at paragraph 192. on page 390 of the, the bundle. So he specifically um, refers and directs himself with reference to the, uh, the reasoning of the European Court in the leading case. Um, and they said the requirement of a particular legal relationship is to limit the effect of an agreement conferring jurisdiction to disputes arising, originating from the legal relationship in connection with which the agreement is concluded, seeks to prevent a party from being surprised by the referral to a specified court of all disputes which arise in the relationships which it has with the other party, and which may originate in relationships other than that in connection with which the agreement conferring jurisdiction was concluded. Uh, and um, as I say, the learned judge has specifically directed himself with reference to that law he understood that the, what the purpose of the clause was, and he understood that it was seeking to apply some sort of limitation. Now, as far as the Powell Dufferin case is concerned, your, your Lordship will recollect that that was a case where the, the clause was contained in the Articles of Association of a company. Uh, and there were various disputes between the shareholders and the company. And so the first question that had to be asked, and the, the, court, of a, the court of Justice answered, was, is the dispute, which does this dispute, dispute arise in connection with a particular legal relationship? And what they said was, the clause is valid as long as we're concerned with disputes between the, share, the shareholders as such. But it was a matter for the national court to determine whether the actual disputes between the parties were disputes which fell within the scope of the jurisdiction clause. Perhaps I can give an example, which I, I hope might help. Suppose that, um, that I am a shareholder in Barclays Bank. Pick, pick Barclays purely for exposition. Um, and that, suppose that the, the Articles of Association contain a jurisdiction clause, which require me to submit all disputes between me as a shareholder um, to uh, a particular jurisdiction. I suppose also that Barclays lends me some money under a contract of loan. Um, the jurisprudence and the result of the, the jurisprudence of the, the, the Court of Justice in the Powell Dufferin case would say that Barclays couldn't take advantage of the uh, jurisdiction clause in the shareholders' agreement because the dispute, if it arose between me and Barclays in relation to the loan, wouldn't arise um, out of the relationship between me and Barclays uh, as a shareholder as such. So that's that's what what this is seeking to do. Now, the, now there isn't any, uh, any magic about, about this in our submission. When you consider um, the, the, the case, Mr. Beard's case, and only case in our submission, is a decision of the uh, European Court in the CDC case. Uh, and in our submission, the CDC case simply doesn't uh, bear the weight that he's seek, he seeks to put upon it. Um, and the judge's treatment of that case doesn't betray uh, any, <coughs> any error. Now, what do you say CDC shows then? <coughs> what does CDC show? CDC is a case which shows that where there is no connection between the uh, contractual, in that case, we're, we're dealing about a con we're concerned with a contract of sale between a purchaser of hydrogen peroxide and manufacturer. Um, the court in that case decided that the clause did not apply 
to a claim, a tortious claim for damages, because there was no connection between the uh, cartelists' arrangement and the particular <coughs> legal relationship, the contract of supply, in connection which, with which the jurisdiction clause was agreed. Let me, um, <coughs> let me open up the CDC case, if I may, <coughs> and make that good. Um, four, mm, four tab 48 in the authorities. Um, and before I get to the, uh, the reasoning in the European Court, may I direct the Court's attention to what the Attorney General said in paragraph I keep saying Attorney General, forgive me, I mean Advocate General. Paragraph 7 uh, on page 1610, I would emphasise that this case is the first in which the court has been asked to adjudicate directly on the interaction between, on the one hand, uh, provisions of primary law guaranteeing freedom of competition within the European Union, and on the other, provisions of EU private international law relating to jurisdiction in civil and commercial matters in a dispute characterised by a far-reaching cartel agreement which has myriad participants and injured parties and has distorted competition through the internal market. Now, it's important in my submission to bear that context in mind when one uh, attempts to understand what it is that CDC in fact decided. And... Um, in this case, therefore, you know, my lord and my ladies, uh, the, we, had a, we had a cartel uh, whose object or effect, in accordance with the relevant uh, article of the PFEU, was uh, preventing, distorting, and restricting competition in the market as a whole. And so the immediate object uh, of their behaviour was directed at the market and not at the uh, not at any third party further down in the supply chain. There is no direct link, no direct link between the cartelists' agreement, which is set itself a violation of the article, and the subsequent contract which um, the relevant claimants uh, entered into. So, apart from its effects on the market as a whole cartel was unrelated to the individual contracts which were made by purchasers in the market. But as I've been trying to submit, when one looks at the pleaded case, what are the disputes in this case, there is the most direct and immediate link between the alleged improper arrangements between um, Mr. Al-Rajan and the banks. One was quid pro quo for the other. And that is a feature which immediately distinguishes this case from the CDC case. Now, I'm not going to go, go back to the uh, passage uh, in Mr. Briggs's recent book, but he does suggest that in the CDC case, the, uh, East, the CJU may have overstepped the mark in uh, formulating an interpretation of the clause which he says is a matter for the national court. Now, be that as it may, whether Professor Briggs is right or wrong about that, the distinguishing feature between that case and this case is the direct link between the alleged improper behaviour on the part of the banks and their employees or partners and the contracts which were entered into. There's a direct connection now, can I then look at the Apple sales case, which comes after CDC, which we have at, at volume uh, five, page uh, 52. Uh, and the learned judge referred to this in his judgment at paragraph 205 to 207. Uh, and your lordship will recollect that yesterday there was some uh, debate as to whether the, the learned judge's use of the word, the word distinguished 
was, was apposite or not. Actually, it was perfectly apposite when one sees what the Attorney General, the Advocate General, had to say uh, in Apple sales about CDC. If what the uh, Advocate General was doing... I'm sorry, uh, I'm just going back to... Forgive me, Mr. my lady. I mean, the whole thrust of Mr Beard's submissions is yes. that um, these cases established as a matter of principle you have to adopt a narrow interpretation yes. for EU law purposes. Yes. And you're going to deal with that head-on in your, in your... Yes. And, and, and what one sees when one comes to the uh, Advocate General's uh, opinion in the Apple sales case is that EU law is not hostile to uh, the inclusion of broad jurisdiction clauses provided they are agreed in connection, uh, provided that the disputes arise out of immediately or more remotely with a particular legal relationship. That's how, how it's dealt with in this Apple sales case, which in my submission is extremely important <coughs> because it does show uh, that even on the case which was made by Mr. Beard, CDC doesn't go as far as he needs. He certainly doesn't say this court uh, should conclude that unless you include in a broad jurisdiction uh, a footnote saying, by the way, this, although it says any, any, any disputes between the parties, this also covers uh, allegations of bribery, allegations of fraud, or anything unforeseen. What, the, what, what we see from Apple sales is that you don't need to do that. And CDC doesn't stand for the proposition that you do need to do that. Um, if we um, start in CDC, if I may. Um, Are we in Apple at the moment? <laughs> I'm in Apple for the moment, my lord. Okay. Um, at uh, page 1747, 1747, the Advocate General says this case, the case thus offers a further opportunity uh, to having regard to the solution reached by the court in the case that gave rise to cartel claims to provide clarification to the operators concerned in their capacity as drafters of jurisdiction clauses, and in addition, as persons wishing to bring proceedings for compensation for losses, the source of which is alleged to lie in an infringement of competition law. So the specific context, as we see in CDC, is again uh, a claim relating to competition law breaches. Um, you, you made the um, possibly telling point that in 50 years there hadn't been an instance of anybody saying um, fraud and bribery could not come within the scope of a DJC. No. Um, but looking at it the other way, are, are these two competition cases the closest one gets to um, um, to that situation before one then comes to this case? Um, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't accept that. I mean, it, one has to. Uh, I say one has to read these in the context in which they are expressed. I understand that, but I'm just you, you, you made the point that, that um, it would be remarkable. It um, would if um, if this was a good point that, yeah. it, that, that um, the, these appellants were the first people to have come upon it. Yeah. Um, I was just asking you whether the cases that we're just looking at, uh, CBC and Apple sales, which are to do with um, cartelling use of dominant position and so forth, um, are the nearest one comes to um, an impropriety in the market. I, I think I, I, I can certainly accept the proposition that CDC <coughs> is, the, is, is, is the nearest that... Um, the CDC, CDC before comes, Apple. Yes, before Apple. Apple. Yes. And then when one comes to Apple, one sees the explanation given by the Advocate General in Apple for what, the, for what happened in CDC and how the court should approach matters in a different context, namely um, 102. And what one's going to see is that despite what the court said in CDC, the Advocate General expressed the view that it doesn't follow from CDC that all cartel claims uh, are excluded from a broad um, jurisdiction clause unless the jurisdiction clause expressly mentions cartel claims. What matters is the closeness of the connection between the dispute 
and the legal relationship in connection with which the jurisdiction clause was agreed. That's that's the fundamental touchstone. Yes, so it's really it's the, it's just the proximity. It's not yes. The, not the morality. Yes. The exactly. Now, um, if one please could look at um, paragraphs 34 and 35, which I don't think Mr. Beard referred to in the Advocate General's reasoning, page 1753. Uh, he says this, first of all, the primacy afforded to the autonomy of the parties as expressed in the validly agreed jurisdiction clause means that what matters is whether or not the dispute in question in the present case an action for damages for the loss allegedly sustained as a result, in essence, of anti-competitive conduct can be linked to the legal relationship determined in that clause irrespective of the tortious or contractual nature of the dispute within the meaning of Regulation 44 and a fortiori within the meaning of national provisions. <laughs> Thus, a dispute which is non-contractual in nature, but which arose in connection with the contractual relationship, is capable of coming within the scope of the jurisdiction clause, provided that the jurisdiction has its origin in the contractual relationship in connection with which that clause was entered into. I think in fairness he did refer us to mm. those paragraphs. Give me my lord. Mr. Peer did refer us to those paragraphs. Forgive me, um, I, didn't, I didn't have the note. But that, that's an important aspect uh, of how one should look at these cases. Um, and then, if one goes forward to uh, page 1755, the learned judge refers in his judgment to paragraph 57, but it's important also to look at paragraph 56. To my mind, it would be disproportionate if in all cases the parties to the dispute were required to have precisely specified the nature of the actions which are supposed to come under the jurisdiction clause, provided that the clause is drafted in sufficiently broad terms to include any action arising immediately or more remotely from the contractual relationship in connection with which that clause was entered into. So I say immediately, that shows that there is no hostility as a matter of European law under Article 23 to broadly um, formulated clauses, so long as the dispute arises in, out of, or in connection with uh, the legal relationship in connection with which this clause was agreed. Um, now, the Advocate General's distinguishing, and I use that word advisedly, of the CDC case um, in paragraphs 60 to 66 uh, repays <coughs> reading. And um, could I invite the court uh, either to read it now or to read it in due course? If you, we, we'll read it in due course, but would you just like to um, tell us what we should gain from yes. that reading? Yes, certainly. Um, first of all, one sees that um, the, uh, the, the Advocate General in paragraph 61 is placing uh, the circumstances of the CDC case in context. First of all, it was a case which was concerned with uh, claims, aggregated claims, brought together by a number of, uh, by, by a party which had assumed the rights in relation to parties injured by the alleged cartel. And what the Advocate General says is the solution adopted in that case, precluding the reliance on jurisdiction clauses, he, as he says, had the advantage of avoiding compensation proceedings being split up between several fora and courts as would have resulted from a broad interpretation of the scope of the jurisdiction clauses contained in contracts which are unconnected with the unlawful uh, cartel. So there's a policy decision there, if I can, if I can use that word, um, being recognized by the Advocate General. It's very convenient that it, that it, could, be, it could operate in that particular way. Um, but the cartel was unrelated to the contracts of sale in connection with which the jurisdiction clauses uh, had been entered into. That's the, that's, that's the absence of connection. Um, that's the most important, above all. Above all, 
Yes. And then in 65, this is important too, the requirement of an express reference to disputes. Sorry, it, this cartel was secret and therefore unrelated. Yes, it was secret. Well, what's said against you, is it? Is it here again, it's all secret and therefore unrelated? Well, that's what they, that's what they say, but you, you've got to, you've got to leave aside the fact that they use the word secret. Uh, it's true that in the cartel case, the knowledge of the existence of the cartel was not known. But if, if the word secret was a magic wand which entitled one to um, escape from a jurisdiction clause, then simply one would say, well, I didn't know about the fact that, um, there, were, the, the, that there was a pre-contractual misrepresentation. I didn't know about the fact there was pre-contractual bribery. Secrecy is, is a matter which is specific related, in, in my submission, to this particular way of analyzing the claim which arose in that case. And if one goes on, paragraph 65, one sees that, that that is correct. He says, to my mind, the requirement of an express reference to disputes in connection with liability incurred as a result of an infringement of competition appears to be relevant only in the case of disputes which clearly do not have their origin in the legal relationship in connection with which the agreement conferring jurisdiction was entered into. So, as I say, my submission is that secrecy is not the beginning and the end of this, as the Advocate General rightly says. And then he goes on to say, the guidance provided by the court must thus be understood as being intended to make clear that disputes at issue must actually have their origin in the contractual relationship between the parties. See the cartel case. Conversely, the solution applied by the court cannot, in my view, be interpreted as requiring a jurisdiction clause to state precisely all the disputes of a tortious nature that might arise between the parties. In that regard, it cannot, for example, be precluded that certain types of conduct alleged to constitute a cartel or an abusive dominant position, such as the types of conduct that may be employed in the context of the selective distribution system, may have a connection with the distribution agreement and thus be covered by the jurisdiction clause in such a contract, which has been drafted in general terms without expressly specifying the possible actions for breach of the provisions applicable in competition matters. Um, and then, finally, on uh, this page of 1757, if one looks at paragraph 71, the Advocate General says this, it's necessary to determine each case, and therefore independently of the legal basis of the action, whether the conduct at the origin of the dispute is linked to the contractual relationship in connection with which the jurisdiction clause was entered into. Um, and in our submission on that basis, on the basis of the pleaded case, which is uh, the analytical basis for this court, for Mr. Justice Henshaw's analysis, and indeed for this court, uh, plainly, the conduct at the origin of the dispute is linked to the um, contractual relationships entered into by Pictet and Piss. I think we have that, that point. We've, we've looked at this um, before, and this is the Advocate General, is it? It is. Is there more that you want out of Apple say? Yes, there is. Right. Let's um well, shall we shall we finish up Apple sales and then have a short break? My lord, yes. Uh, uh, subject to the court I'm making decent progress to be finished by the time I said I would finish. Well, if if by that you mean within another quarter of an hour we could more conveniently have the break then, but I don't want you to feel under unreasonable uh, I don't feel under pressure. unreasonable pressure, my lord. Shall I continue? Yes, please. Right. Um, uh, if one looks uh, in the judgment of the court, uh, paragraph uh, 20, 26, I think Mr. Beard read to you yesterday, page 1766 of the bundle, uh, one sees that the court says, in the light of that case law, it's appropriate to examine whether that interpretation of Article 23 and the grounds which is based are also valid with regard to a jurisdiction clause invoked during a jurisdiction, invoked during a dispute that relates to tortious liability allegedly incurred by one contracting party as a result of the breach of Article 102. The court goes on, that is the case where the alleged anti-competitive conduct has no connection with the contractual relationship in the context of which the jurisdiction clause was agreed. So CDC 
is it saying that was a case where there was no connection. Um, and in principle, paragraph 28, anti-competitive conduct covered by Article 1 and 1 is in principle not directly linked to the contractual relationship. Whereas, as they go on to say, the abuse of a dominant position can materialize in contractual relations that an undertaking in a dominant position establishes and by means of contractual terms. Now, um, the judge used that phrase, took that phrase materialize from the Apple sales judgment, and he was criticized for it. But all the, uh, all the judge was saying, and all that the court is saying in relation to the use of that term, it's not a term of art, the question is, is there a sufficient connection or link between the, uh, the conduct, uh, which is complained of, and the particular legal relationship? Um, Etihad and Flirter. Um, essentially, the judgment of Mr. Justice Jacobs, for which the, the judge uh, made, uh, relied on to a considerable extent, wasn't criticized. The reasoning in that case wasn't criticized by uh, my learned friends. But it's important that uh, the court. Uh, has in mind what uh, the learned judge said, not binding on this court, obviously, but we rely on the learned judge's reasoning. Uh, in Are we going to Etihad or to the judgment of the judge? Um, I'm referring to Etihad, my lady, which is at, forgive me, Authorities Bundle 3, tab 27. Uh, and the discussion um, of uh, the, the, this particular point, particular legal relationship, starts at paragraph 123 of Mr. Justice Jacobs' judgment, and he refers in paragraph 123 to the leading case of the Paul Dufferin, uh, which indeed, as I've shown you, called Mr. Justice Henshaw referred to it too. And um, paragraph 124, um, it's necessary to identify the particular legal relationship and ask if the dispute arose in connection with it. Well, I've made my submissions as to what the particular legal relationship was in this case. In this particular case, obviously the question arose was, well, was the comfort letter which was provided in the context of a financial rescue package, was that covered by the jurisdiction clause? And regarding it largely as a, as a question of fact, the learned judge in Etihad concluded that um, it formed part of the same legal relationship. Um, now, in paragraph 125, he agreed that the legal test is not simply whether a party would be taken by surprise. But in a passage also cited by the judge, um, he, he said this, if it's clear, and this is on page 877 at the top of the page, if it's clear that a party would not be taken by surprise by referral of the dispute, then it's very likely indeed that the dispute has not originated in a relationship other than that in connection with which the agreement was concluded. It's therefore very likely that application of the legal test and the answer to the question whether a party would be taken by surprise will lead to the same result. In our submission, they do lead to the same result uh, in the context of this case. Um, now, it seems to be a very subjective um, question as to whether a party would be taken by surprise. I suppose it depends upon how easily they're likely to be surprised. I, mean, I, I realise it's not a test, but I don't really know what, except in the most obvious and glaring of cases, it's adding to the proper... It may not add very much, but it, at least it's something which... Um, you know, the European Court has identified as yeah. being part of the, con the, the consideration. Um, now, uh, in paragraph 126, one sees that um, Mr. Justice Jacob treated the CDC case as an illustration of the distinction in practice. Um, and that, um, again, 
So he, <coughs> Jacob was right about that. And it, it means, in our submission, that the, the, great, the great burden that um, Mr. Beer places on CDC just doesn't take him anywhere in the context of the facts of this case. Now, uh, in paragraph 133, we see that um, the question, and we've seen this before, it's not simply whether well, the, the dispute arises under the contract, but whether the, which contains the clause, but whether it arises in connection with a relationship, which may or may not be broader. And if one, um, one looks at what this is just as Jacob said in paragraph 149, we invite the court to look at that, page 881. Consideration of the context is important. In this case, what we have is pleaded against Picte as an ever-expanding relationship between the politics and the provision of financial services. So when one gets to the stage of asking, which is uh, now in front of this Justice Henshaw, now in front of this court, what is the relationship between the parties? There is nothing as a matter of principle in European law which prevents the parties from mutually expanding their uh, existing legal relationship, which is precisely what was done in this case. And there's nothing in European law which prevents the parties from agreeing broadly uh, defined jurisdiction clauses, broadly expressed jurisdiction clauses, to cover the extent of that entire uh, legal relationship. Now, that. Uh, is all I want to say about that. One's then left with the question, which is a respondent's notice question, as to whether the uh, accessory claims are within the jurisdiction clause. They're dealt with in our... Sea, forgive me, my lord. Are we, are we under C? We're under C. Yeah. Um, whether the jurisdiction clause is broad enough to encompass um, uh, alleged laundering of uh, monies paid not by Pictet, to Mr. al Rajan, but monies he received from others. And um, this issue doesn't need to be decided if the court uh, rejects Piff's appeal on the Article 6 point. Because if Piff rejects the appeal on the Article 6 point, and whether or not these are covered by the jurisdiction clause, it means that the clauses have to be brought in the domicile uh, of the parties. Um, now, um, we deal with this in our uh, skeleton at paragraphs 68 to 76. Um, and can I, can I make, as quickly as I can, a, a number of points about what the, what the judge said? He recognized that the way in which Piffs put the case was that there was a, as, as he described, a unitary scheme. In other words, um, Piffs um, entered in, Piff's agent, Mr. al Rajan, entered into improper arrangements with Picte, for which he was paid in relation to investments made by Picte, Piffs with Picte. But they also said there was, a, there was a broader element to this, whereby the accounts which had been used to, to, um, to hide the secret commissions were also used uh, to hide other monies. So he said there was a unitary scheme and on the basis of the way in which um, PIFs put their case, if that's right, if it was a unitary scheme, then there is no reason why the jurisdiction clause, which covers all disputes arising between the parties, or not as a matter of construction, Swiss law construction, extend to those claims. Um, 
Hiss said there was a continuing course of conduct. And if there's a continuing course of conduct, then disputes arising in relation to that continuing course of conduct <coughs> only fall within the context or the ambit of the jurisdiction. <coughs> Furthermore, it is a necessary part of um, Hiff's case that the knowledge which was acquired by uh, the uh, individuals acting on behalf of Picte formed the basis of knowledge uh, in relation to uh, laundering of other, other, other facts. So there's a crossover uh, in relation uh, both to the, the conduct and in relation to the knowledge. And in those circumstances, we say there is a clear connection between the relevant claims. Uh, and uh, in, in those circumstances, um, it is right that um, the, the learned judge should have determined that the jurisdiction clause, as a matter of Swiss law, which is what we're concerned with here, covered those uh, closely linked laundry claims. This is a challenge to paragraph 320 of the judgment. Right. right. Um, and indeed, in our submission, when one considers whether parties objectively would have expected those disputes to fall within a broad uh, jurisdiction clause, <coughs> They would have expected them to cover both the laundering, the alleged laundering of the commissions paid to Mr. Picte as a result of the services provided by Picte to Pips, as well as uh, associated laundering claims. The difference in the source of the sums being allegedly laundered shouldn't make any difference as to what commercially minded parties would have expected. Um, my Lord, I've made it to 3.15. And um, unless you have any further questions for me, I'm proposing to stop. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Thank you, my Lord. We'll, um, we'll hear um, Mr. Atkin at 25 past. Yeah. Right, should we go? 
Yeah, no, I'm just wondering how. Sorry. Can you cut King Steel and Yen? Well, I, I, that's probably the answer at the end. If you're I doing Article 6, I can just kind of zing that. I didn't need all my papers. Right yeah, that would be there. great. Yeah. yeah. So if you I'm, could just sort of give me sort of I, this I, space. Yeah, well, I think what I can do is give you more. That would be that great. Space. In fact, if you, yeah, that, that would be perfect. That if would I be can wonderful. Stick, if, can I stick a, a file box on there? Yes. Yeah, yeah absolutely. That? No, no okay. you can. I, I can confine then, myself. Can I give you the desk space? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. I think what, what I want to do is get this box up here yeah. so that I can make my from it. And then I'm basically happy. It's a great piece of furniture, Ken. It is. My, my kids' siblings gave it to me when I took soap. Oh, really? And I've had it all over the world with me. Well, so it's an antique. I wouldn't say so. Oh, you cheeky boy. <laughs> Yeah, a few it's years a ago. Yes. On that one, oh, I know. I'm a bit tired. Just yeah. Bosh. reflecting on the many years of <laughs> valuable experience. Yeah. Good. Right, on we go. Thank you. Yeah, I thought, I mean, I think, I think, I think she and she is are, are there. No, that's my thing. Yeah. I think, I think he is. I think that seems um, a surprise. I mean, I'm suddenly saying, oh, this cost is very expensive. I don't think it is actually. No, I, I mean, it, it, it is. Would, 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 would you reasonable. expect a oh, reasonable person no, no, knowing what the part of it is? A big gobsmacked. No, but. Of course it is. The gobsmacked. Yeah, it is.
Because yeah. uh, yes, Are you sure. Yep. I'm happy. If it starts to the <laughs> I can. You're in a little box. Yeah, I am. I'm in a little yeah. box. How much time have they given you? Uh, I think until the end of today, all being well. Uh, my lady's all being well for whom? For me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll sit till 4.30. I'm extremely grateful, my lord. Um, I'm going to address to you, as your lordship and your ladyships know, on Article 6, which is our issues 4 and 5 on the list of issues. The point arises in relation to all of the respondents apart from the two respondents who are domiciled outside convention or regulation states. These are Pictet Bahamas and Pictet Asia. It's been agreed by the respondents uh, that I should address you on the point of principle that is engaged by Article 6, uh, in the hope that others who follow me uh, will not need to make extensive submissions on that point. So it applies to all of the respondents. That depends on the outcome on Article yes, 23. Yes, it does. Potentially right. applies to everybody. Except for Bahamas and Asia. It does. And I'm going to introduce the point and explain, situate it in the appeal, as it were, um, to um, your lordship. Your lordship is quite right. It depends on the outcome. I'm going to start, I hope, by explaining, having introduced the point, explaining how it depends on the outcome and what the various per permutations uh, imply for the Article 6 point. Um, uh, the point arises in this way. The judge found, as you, did, you know, that claims A and B uh, were subject to exclusive jurisdiction clauses, which required them, with one exception, to be brought in Switzerland against the defendant who had the benefit of those jurisdiction clauses, all of whom, and this is important, are domiciled in Switzerland. I'll refer to those claimants, if, uh, defendants, if I may, as the jurisdiction clause defendants, just for ease of nomenclature. And that category, of course, includes my client, Mr. Berterat. The exception I mentioned is that claims A and B against Pictet Europe uh, were, the court found, subject to exclusive jurisdiction clauses in favour of Luxembourg, and Luxembourg is where Pictet Europe is domiciled. But that wrinkle uh, may not be greatly relevant because Pecte Europe, amongst other things, has undertaken to submit to the jurisdiction in uh, Switzerland. So having found, subject to that wrinkle, that claims A and B had to be pursued against the jurisdiction clause defendants in Switzerland if they were to be pursued at all, the judge further concluded in a finding at paragraph 408 of his judgment, which has not been challenged, that he should proceed on the footing that those claims would be pursued there, not least because PIFs had offered no undertaking not to do so. And indeed, that remains the position So I drew today. attention to that. So that, that's, as you say, not challenged. Um, but you are going to address the suggestion that the proceedings have to be actual. Yes. Yes, I am. And that's quite the wrong. The future won't, go, won't do. And it is quite that. wrong. And indeed, it is contradicted by a decision of this court in the case of Alpha Laval, which I will take your ladyships. Well, I think there must be lots do. of cases. There must be lots of Article 6 cases that have been determined by reference to the risk of future proceedings. Uh, in a sense, every... Risk likelihood, certainty, whatever. Yes, yes. But may I just I pick your ladyship up on this mm. peculiarity, mm. that what is unusual about our case is two features which are, which are unusual. The first feature is that there are exclusive jurisdiction clauses in play. And the second feature is that the defendants who have the benefit of those exclusive jurisdiction clauses can be sued in the jurisdiction, are domiciled in the jurisdiction. And why does that matter? And that matters because when one is evaluating the risk of irreconcilable judgments, uh, so to take this case, you have claims A and B which are subject to the exclusive jurisdiction clauses, and claim C, which the judge found, aren't. You can pursue claim C against the same defendants in Switzerland because they are domiciled there. And as your ladyship recalls, the 
starting point well, for the convention two. is Article right. 2. So, so the fact that it's coincidence, you say, doesn't matter, and you'll come on to whether or not there is any sort of, you, I think it's a devaluative exercise, and one of the yes, points Mr I will do. Beard makes is, no, no, yes. it's, it's, it's a cut and dried I will, exercise. I will come on, on to all of that in, in detail and show you, ladyship, two authorities of this court, one research in motion and the other out of the bow, which address precisely that point. Uh, but before I do it, um, and as it were, by way of run up to the wicket, uh, having to, to go back to where the case sits, how the judge get, got to where he got to, having found that claims A and B had to be proceeded with in, in Switzerland uh, against the jurisdiction <coughs> clause defendants, and that he should proceed on the footing that they would be proceeded with there, so that's the paragraph 408 of the judgment point, he then had to consider, first, whether the requirements of Article 6.1 were satisfied in relation to the C claims against those defendants, and i.e. the jurisdiction clause defendants, and second, whether the article was satisfied in relation to claims A, B and C against the other defendants who did not have the benefit of the exclusive jurisdiction clauses, but who were domiciled in Switzerland and could therefore be sued there alongside the jurisdiction clause defendants in any event. And in considering both of those matters, the judge found that he was not required solely to take into account the risk of irreconcilable judgments between the claims made in England and against the, uh, sorry, between the claims made in England against the anchor defendants, i.e. Mr. al Rajan and his wife, on the one hand, and the court claims sought to be pursued against the target defendants if those claims had to be pursued elsewhere on the other hand. He found that in applying the Article 6.1 test, he could also properly take into account the risk of irreconcilable judgments created by the fact that the A and B claims would be pursued against a number of the target defendants in Switzerland in any event. And he found that to leave that fact out of account would, to adopt his memorable phrase, be to be willfully blind. So in considering whether the requirements of Article 6.1 were satisfied in relation to the CE claims against the jurisdiction clause defendants who would be faced with the A and B claims in Switzerland, the judge considered that it was appropriate to take into account the risk of irreconcilable judgments between the C claims, if proceeded with against those defendants in England, and the A and B claims, which would be proceeded against with against the very same defendants in Switzerland. That was a risk, the judge concluded, which would be eliminated if he declined jurisdiction over the C claims against those defendants, because being domiciled in Switzerland, they could each be sued in Switzerland uh, uh, where the A and B claims would be litigated. Uh, it, it was also, the judge found, a greater and less acceptable risk uh, than the risk of irreconcilable judgments uh, between the claims against the anchor defendants in England and the C claims if, uh, uh, if uh, determined in uh, sorry, let me start that again. It was also a greater and less, less, less acceptable risk than the risk of irreconcilable judgments between the claims against the anchor defendants in England and the sea claims if pursued in Switzerland. <clears throat> so he concluded, having done all that, that the Article 6.1 test was not met in relation to the sea claims against the jurisdiction clause defendants because the risk of irreconcilable judgments would be increased rather than reduced if those claims were tried in England rather than in Switzerland. And then that has knock-on knock -on consequences for the non-EJC -E defendants exactly. That's and the so last. on and so forth. Exactly. Just so that um, somebody's got to be asked this question. Uh, everything turns on, um, it all unravels from top down. If if we um, are against you on Article Twenty Three, and Article Six has to be Six has to be considered in a completely fresh 
and different context, then is uh, is the party's position that we we carry out the exercise afresh? No, no we lose. If, right. if you're against us on Article 23, the consequence of that is that the A and B claims will be pursued against the jurisdiction clause defendants in England. There is therefore no other set of proceedings in Switzerland with which the C claims or any other claims could be irreconcilable, and that's the end of that. Conversely, and it's worth just making this point to complete the picture, if the respondent's notice is successful on the C claims, so that your uh, ladyships and your lordship conclude yeah. that those are called by the exclusive Everything jurisdiction has to clause, Switzerland. then subject to one point, everything has to go to Switzerland. The su one qualification to that is that there are defendants, Mr. Arjan, Mr. Amusegar, who don't have the benefit of any exclusive jurisdiction. Correct. Clause. So, then so they Article, still have six, Article 6 arguments. They would still have an Article 6 argument. Right. But so far as the jurisdiction clause defendants are concerned, if the respondent's notice is successful, then Article 6 is moot because it all goes to Switzerland. So, including, if, for, including for your client. Including so let me get that clear. You and I am going to assume for present purposes all the respondents agree that if they lose um, on material validity on Article 23, and if Bonk Picte and Mr. Bertere lose on formal validity, um, the appeal succeeds full stop. Yes. 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 Uh, Thank you. Now, uh, my lady, so that's, that is, as it were, situating the Article 6 point within both the judge's reasoning and also the appeal. Um, and the next task is to identify the issues which the appeal throws up in relation to it. And they are uh, twofold. The judge's uh, uh, findings on Article 6 are challenged on two broad bases. The first, which is up ground 6 to 8 of the grounds of appeal, is the point of principle. Uh, and that is uh, that it is said that the test in Article 6 1 permits the court to take into account only the risk of irreconcilable judgments as between the claims against the anchor defendants and the proposed claims against the target defendants. And in particular, it is said to be impermissible to take into account the existence of other claims elsewhere and to evaluate, as the judge did, whether the risk of irreconcilable judgment would be increased or reduced by accepting jurisdiction over the relevant claims under Article 6. That objection raises an issue of interpretation of Article 6, 1, the meaning of which is, of course, an autonomous question of European law. It is a point which applies to all of the respondents, and I will address it in detail. The second objection, which is grounds 9 and 10 of the grounds of appeal, is assumes, uh, it, uh, the second objection assumes, contrary to the first objection, that the judge's interpretation of Article 6, 1 was correct but asserts that even if that is so, then his application of the tests on the facts of this case was wrong in relation to each of the respondents. Uh, that objection raises different considerations for different respondents, although it raises essentially the same points for Bonk, Pictet and Mr. Berterat, and indeed for Pictet Europe. Uh, I will cover the ground in relation to them, although I will do so very briefly because in my submission, uh, if the test is as the judge said it is, then the answer in this case is blindingly obvious. Uh, so the first point, the point of principle, uh, we submit the judge was right for the reasons he gave. And those are essentially threefold, and they can be briefly summarized before turning to the detail of the argument in relation to each of them. First, as the judge found, the approach which he adopted is entirely consistent with the language of Article 6, 1. Second, it is the only approach which is consistent with the object or purpose of that article and which gives effect to that object or purpose. That object or purpose is the sound administration of justice and, in particular, the reduction so far as possible of irreconcilable judgments between member states. The approach for which PIFS contains
tends, <coughs> would have the opposite effect. It would frustrate the object of the article, not accomplish it. Third, there is nothing in the relevant authorities, and in particular in the decision of this court in Aeroflot and Berezovsky, which required the judge to reach a different conclusion from that which he considered the purpose of Article 6.1 required and the language of Article 6.1 permitted. Indeed, as I will come on to submit, it is possible to go rather further than the judge did because there is a line of authorities which was not put before him, which preceded the decision in Air of Lot, and which strongly suggests that the judge's approach was the right one, including the decision of this court in Research in Motion and in Alpha Laval, which my learned friend has not addressed either in his supplemental skeleton. That's or just a tool submission. Uh, Laval. Laval is uh, Longmore, Mr. Uh, Lord Justice Longmore. <clears throat> so, my lady, I'm going to uh, take each point in turn, uh, picking up points taken by my learned friend along the way. Now, the language of Article 6 1, the current version your le Lordship and your Ladyships have seen, but let us, if we may, look at it again. Uh, in its current form, which is the 2007 revision to the Convention, it is at, a, uh, at the Authorities, Volume 5, Tab uh, 54, at uh, page 1811. <clears throat> now this is language with which you are very familiar by now uh, but I do want to read it again and make some submissions uh, on its content the person domiciled in a state bound by this convention may also be sued where he is one of a number of defendants in the courts for the place where any one of them is domiciled, provided the claims are so closely connected that is a, it is expedient to hear and determine them together to avoid the risk of irreconcilable judgments resulting from separate proceedings. The issue of interpretation which this throws up is this. Must the question of whether the claims against the anchor defendants and the proposed claims against the target defendants are, quote, so closely connected <coughs> that it is expedient to hear and determine them together to avoid the risk of irreconcilable judgments from separate proceedings, must that question be answered solely by reference to the nature and degree of connection between those sets of claims alone? Confining the analysis for the moment just to the language of the article, the answer to that question, simply as a matter of language, is we submit plainly no. As the judge found at paragraph 432 of his judgment, depending on the facts, it may well be the case that the claims against the anchor defendant and the proposed claims against the target defendant are not so closely connected that it is expedient to hear and determine them together to avoid the risk of irreconcilable judgments from separate proceedings, if by doing so, the court would create a greater risk of irreconcilable judgments arising from separate proceedings against the target defendant itself. To leave that out of account when carrying out the evaluation which the use of the word expedient indicates the court is required to undertake would indeed be, as the judge we respectfully submit rightly put it, to be willfully blind in a way which the language of the article does not require. So the judge's approach to the language of the article was, we suggest, entirely correct. Now, pausing there, I, I want, if I may, just to pick up at this point, a point which emerged from my lady, Lady Justice, Simler's intervention during my learned friend's submissions. There is, we suggest, to put it at its lowest, something of an oddity in my learned friend's stance that the court cannot consider matters in applying the test set out in the article simply because they are hypothetical and not actual 
at the time of its consideration, albeit that they are very likely to eventuate in the future. As we can see, the article requires the court, requires the court to conduct a hypothetical exercise by considering the position that would pertain if the claims against the anchor defendant were to proceed in England and the claims against the target defendant, defendant were to proceed elsewhere in its state of domicile. That hypothetical counterfactual has to be considered in any event. But my learned friend says that the hypothetical counterfactual can only be considered in a vacuum. Divorced from what the position would be if the counterfactual actually pertained, and in particular, divorced from the important fact that there would be related claims in the jurisdiction of the target defendant's domicile in any event. The language of the article, sticking for the moment with the language, does not require that. And in fact, it is, as I've already mentioned <coughs> to uh, the bench, inconsistent flatly with what this court has said elsewhere. So that's the language. The next can, point. Can just put, put, pause on the language for a moment. Um, do you want to just dwell on what's meant by separate proceedings? Yes. I mean, isn't that where the nub, the sum of this argument resides? You know, involving whom and where? Right. Um, because I can see that th these issues may arise where one's talking about separating out a flock of defendants into two jurisdictions, or where one's considering um, uh, bisecting individual defendants and, and, and asking them to respond to two related types of matter in two different trials in two jurisdictions. Is it right, presumably it's right, that, that each of those gives rise to a possibility of an irreconcilable judgment? Yes. Um, and so if, if the expression separate proceedings, uh, which we've not looked so much at rather than expedient, which has an evaluative quality to it, needs attention, doesn't it? Well, what it does, there are two aspects to that. The first point to make, um, which is not quite dealing with your Lordship's point, but it's in, as it were, on the way there, is what the article doesn't say. Firstly, self-evidently, it doesn't define what the separate proceedings are. Does so it say it doesn't, separate proceedings here? It doesn't say separate proceedings. Or separate proceedings with these defendants. With these defendants. It is unconfined. Now, ordinarily, the uh, situation that the court is likely to face will be a situation in which you either have both claims, as it were, the anchor defendant claims and the target defendant claims in one place, or you have them in two places. Because, as I've mentioned, our situation is quite unusual in that you are certainly going to have overlapping claims in another jurisdiction, Switzerland, and what's more, the target claims against that are sought to be brought in England against those same defendants can be pursued against them alongside the other claims in Switzerland. So that's an unusual situation. I mean, one, one thing that might, this may be well off our, our point, but one thing that might be in, in the mind of anybody trying to case manage something of this sort and make a principal decision is the, the implications for a particular defendant of having to, of having to defend proceedings in two jurisdictions yes. as a result of the issues having been sliced up in that way. Yeah. That, that would seem, in a sense, to, to immediately give rise to a is this right um, instinct. Yes, and, and that's why I make the submission which I made earlier, that if the test is not confined in the way that my learned but friend... But take all of these matters into account. It, it, it is blindingly obvious what the result is. Now, I don't say, I don't say that it's a forum conveniens type no. of test by the back door, but I do say two things. Firstly, separate proceedings is not confined to the proceedings against the anchor defendant and the proceedings against the target. It, it, it is, it is unrestrained I, I, in that I didn't way. I think this, um, where Mr Beard was, was making his submission, but I mean, he'll be able to reply, but it yes. seems that he might be placing quite a lot of weight on separate proceedings yes. and narrowing and, it more than you and it, prefer to. Yes, and it's misplaced weight because it doesn't say what he wants it to say. 
But secondly, and importantly, there is this word expediency. The question of uh, the, the question which Article Six requires the court to consider isn't a binary one in the sense that if there is a level of connection, then that's the end of the evaluation. It is an evaluation which the court requires the court to consider the expediency of trying the two claims together. And the real issue is by what touchstone should that question be considered? And the answer which the judge gave, and the answer which we give, and the answer we submit, which the background and the obvious purpose of the article gives, which I'll show you in a moment, is the touchstone is the avoidance of irreconcilable judgments between member states. Not the avoidance of irreconcilable judgments confined only to the claim against the anchor defendant and the claim against the target defendant, doesn't say that. It is the avoidance generally of irreconcilable judgments between member states. I'm not, I don't remember him coming up with that. It's not, it's not natural, is it, to speak about judgments between member states, judgments are between parties in, yeah. me, in different member states. Where do you say he, he identified this as the touchstone? No, no, that's what I'm saying is the touchstone. Right, I thought you said the judge said. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yes, he, 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 he does. Right. My, my lady, and this is a passage of the judgment which you weren't taken to, but it is a, a terrifically important passage, and it, in a way it's the curtain raiser for my second point, which is what is the object of the article. Mm -hmm. But let me, let me um, take your ladyship to it. It's at uh, the core volume uh, 2, uh, tab 23, uh, and uh, the passage is that starts at paragraph 431. Now, you were shown the first part of paragraph 431, uh, but I want to show you uh, the second part of it, and indeed 432. The justification for... Just reading from the middle, as it were. Yes. The justification for assuming jurisdiction under Article 6 as a derogation from that basic rule, i.e. the basic rule that you sue the defendant in their state of domicile, is the desirability of avoiding concurrent proceedings and irreconcilable judgments between different convention states. Moreover, the broader objectives underlying the legislation, as expressed in Recital 12 of the Reg Brussels Regulation, include the sound administration of justice. Now, we will come on to all of this in my second point, but the judge is absolutely bang on the money, we submit, in identifying what the purpose of the article is. The article is a derogation from the rule that you have to sue a defendant in their state of domicile. What is the purpose of the derogation? Is it, it is to avoid irreconcilable judgments between member states. Why is that purpose important? Because the convention, and indeed the regulation, is not simply a mechanism for identifying jurisdiction. It is also a mechanism for recognising judgments. And this is Pena. It's pa exactly my, my, my lady's absolutely right. It is Pena, and I'll take your ladyship to it. Um, so, my lady, to make good uh, my submission that the judge was absolutely right <coughs> in identifying what the purpose of the article is, I need to just take you through a but few but of the background. Before we leave ir irreconcilable judgments, again, and I see that the judge says that, and it's irreconcilable judgments between different member states, and no doubt he's right about that. But one can equally, one equally see the, the risk that if the defendant was being sued in two places, and um, on it, it, arising out of the same series of transactions, but one issue was in one place and another issue was in another place, and um, one court finds that he's uh, dishonest and another court finds that he isn't. Um, I mean, why, why is that out with? Article 6, an irreconcilable judgment. It isn't. It's our case. Yeah. It is absolutely our case. I mean, the, the, the judge found that claims A and B had to be litigated against my client, let's say, although there are many others, against Mr. Berterat in Switzerland. Those claims will involve the court inevitably in considering whether he did anything wrong 
in his transactions with Mr. Al yes, I, I, I don't think I've made my point. I'm so sorry, I'm misunderstanding. We should, we should move on quickly from it anyhow. But um, let, let's suppose in relation to a certain series of transactions involving a certain sum of money, it, uh, litigate in one country on the basis of, of, of the defendant's honesty, um, he succeeded. But in relation to another series of transactions which were essentially um, of the same nature, yeah. um, he was found to be dishonest. Now that wouldn't give rise to irreconcilable judgments because it's concerning different amounts of money. Um, if you see what I mean, that the it's it's that the, the the interpretation of the evidence is ir irreconcilable. It gives rise to a to an awkward consequence. I'm just arguing for the irreconcilable judgments, not necessarily to, to simply be the fact that you have um, judgments that are conflicting directly with each other. Uh, yes, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of European jurisprudence on what irreconcilable judgment means in that sense, but I'm not sure that engages quite the point that I'm seeking to yeah. well, I, address, I, 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 I which is... Well, I sense it doesn't, so let's move on. Well, okay. um, so, well, th let us start, if we may, with... Um, uh, uh, I, I don't think I need to address your ladyships and your lordship on the proposition, which I believe to be common ground, that in interpreting European legislation, one adopts a purposive approach. Uh, one gets that from the case. What's your second um, purposive? I'm, I'm, I'm on to my what is the purpose or object yeah. of the article. One gets that from the decision of the Court of Justice in Eschig as the judge, which was cited by the judge. Um, the object or, uh, uh, it's paragraph 38 of the Eschig judgment. Yes. Perhaps I ought to show you, ladies. No, no, just where in the judgment is it? Uh, and in the judgment, uh, it's paragraph 420. Uh, and he quotes the relevant, the relevant passage yes. uh, in the judgment. Um, the scheme of the convention, you know, the basic principle is enshrined in Article 2, defendants are to be sued in their state of domicile. Uh, that is... Uh, as Mr. Jennard explained in his report, uh, because uh, it is more difficult for defendants to uh, litigate outside their state of domicile. It's really a point of fairness. But from that basic scheme, there are certain limited derogations. Uh, for example, <coughs> in relation to situations in which the claimant is likely to be the weaker party, to respect party autonomy, uh, and so forth. And Article 6.1 is, of course, one such derogation. And the, the question here is, what is the purpose of the derogation? And the starting point is the Genard Report, and I want to show you a passage from that, which is in Bundle 5, Authorities Bundle 5, uh, at uh, tab 55, uh, page 1849. Uh, and uh, oh, sorry. so sorry, that's the wrong uh, reference. It's, it's uh, bundle six, tab fifty nine. Page one hundred and sixty-seven. Page one thousand one nine six seven. This is the, the Genard report uh, on the sixty-eight uh, Brussels Convention. Uh, the language of Article Six at this point in time, in its original form, as you've seen, didn't include the additional language with which we are concerned. That came after Calphalus. But even without that language, we have a clear indication of what the purpose of the article. <coughs> Uh, is, uh, and we can uh, pick it up at the right-hand column. Uh, it follows from the text of the Convention uh, that where there are several defendants domiciled in different contracting states, the claimant, plaintiff can at his option see them all in the courts of the place where any one of them is domiciled. In order for this rule to be applicable, <coughs> there must be a connection between the claims made against each of the defendants, as, for example, in the case of joint debtors. It follows that action cannot be brought solely for the object of ousting the jurisdiction of the courts of the state in which the defendant is domiciled. And then over the page, <coughs> critical passage, jurisdiction derived from the domicile of one of the defendants 
was adopted by the committee because it makes it possible to obviate the handing down in the contracting state of judgments which are irreconcilable with one another. Now, there are two important points we submit which one can take from that passage, passage of the general report. First is that it was from the outset intended that there was required to be a connection between the claims made against each of the defendants in order for Article 6 one to be engaged, even though that language was not in fact in the article as originally contained in the 1968 Brussels Convention. And the second point is that the reason why the article permitted a derogation from the basic principle that a defendant was to be sued in their jurisdiction of domicile was because it made it possible to obviate the handing down of judgments, irreconcilable judgments, by different courts in the contracting states, reducing to a minimum the risk of irreconcilable judgments delivered by different courts in the contracting states was a particular concern, as I've mentioned in the Convention, because it was not simply a jurisdiction convention, it was a judgments recognition convention as well. And the importance of this was stressed in another pass passage in the Genard Report at page 1979, which is worth just picking up uh, to underscore the point I've just submitted. Left-hand column, fourth paragraph down. The intention behind the Convention is to obviate cases of refusal of recognition and enforcement on the basis of Articles 28 and 34, and so, as already stated, to promote the free movement of judgment. So that's uh, the Genard Report. And why does that help you? It underscores the fundamental point we submit, which I'm making, which is that the touchstone of all of this is to reduce the risk of irreconcilable judgments, to allow the free movement of judgments. And if that's the touchstone, then it's entirely appropriate to take into account when applying the expediency test in Article 6 of whether overall <coughs> accepting jurisdiction against the target defendants under it will increase the risk of irreconcilable judgments between member states or reduce it. Now, that brings us, my lady, to Calphalis, uh, and um, that confirms what we've just seen from Jenna. It's an authority which my learned friend placed some reliance on, so I want to look at it again. Um, it's in volume four at tab 37. You were shown the questions referred by the German court there at page 92, and you were then taken to the answers given by the uh, Court of Justice. But before we get there, it's worth, I think, just looking at what the Advocate General said in his opinion, because that opinion was effectively accepted by the court, and it gives a little bit more flavour to what was going on. Uh, and that starts at page 1283 at paragraph uh, two. Uh, so uh, the question, the first question is, must Article 6 be interpreted as meaning that there must be a connection between the action against the various defendants? And the Advocate General approach, uh, General's approach starts at paragraph two. It's necessary first to determine, in view of the lack of any guidance in that regard in Article 6, whether there must be a connection between the claims made against the various defendants. Both legal writers and the national case law on the Convention are unanimous in answering that question in the affirmative. The raison d'etre of such a requirement lies in the concern to ensure the rule actor secretor forum re prevails as a principle, so as to prevent Article 6 from being used solely for the purpose of outing the jurisdiction of the courts of domicile of one of the parties. And then uh, he considers what the national court thought. In paragraph 4, we can pick it up. The national court offers an alternative Either jurisdiction is conferred by virtue of Article 6 whenever the, the claims are similar in fact and in law, or else it is conferred only, conferred only where that course is necessary in order to avoid irreconcilable judgments in separate proceedings. This alternative appears, in fact, to relate to the distinction in German law between ordinary joinder of parties and compulsory joinder of parties. 
The criteria to be chosen by the court in this case must strike a balance between the following two imperatives. One, ensuring the proper administration of justice by avoiding, in particular, the risk of incompatible decisions. And two, ensuring that the rule laid down in Article 2 of the Convention continues to prevail as a principle. Uh, and then he makes his recommendation, as we see in paragraph 11, uh, and paragraph 12 is important. The prevention of the irreconcilable, uh, irreconcilability of decisions is the ratio legis, both of Article 6.1 and of the third paragraph of Article 22. Uh, I can, in those circumstances, I cannot see any good reason for the transposing for not transposing the purpose-related criteria of the latter provision to cases where there are several <coughs> claims. Now, what I draw uh, out of this uh, is, uh, again, the importance being placed uh, on, the, as the Advocate General called it, the ratio legis of Article 6, which is the avoidance of irreconcilable judgments. His reasoning essentially was this. It was a necessary part of Article 6 at 1 that there should be some connection between the claims against the anchor defendant and the target defendant. Otherwise, the article would be used without justification to undermine the basic Article 2 principle. The appropriate criteria were required to strike a balance between that basic principle and the object of Article 6 1, which was to avoid the risk of incompatible decisions. And in view of that, it was sensible to rely on the third paragraph of Article which have the same objective. That's the Lee's pendant um, provision. Uh, and that reasoning was essentially adopted by the court. And it's worth looking again briefly at what the court said. Um, we can pick it up. I think your lordship and your ladyships read it earlier. Uh, but I want just to draw your attention to certain parts of it again. We can pick it up at paragraph 11 on page 1293. Uh, in that regard, it must be noted that the above-mentioned report prepared by the Committee of Experts, that's the Genard report, referred expressly in its explanation of Article 6.1 to the concern to avoid the risk in the contracting states of judgments which are incompatible with each other. Now, again, just pausing there, the Court of Justice has got well in mind the basic object of this article. Reading on. Furthermore, account was taken of that preoccupation in the Convention itself, <coughs> Article 22 of which governs cases of related actions brought before courts in different contracting states. The rule laid down in Article 6 therefore applies where the actions brought <coughs> against the various defendants are related when the proceedings are instituted. That is to say, where it is expedient to hear and determine them together in order to avoid the risk of irreconcilable judgments resulting from separate proceedings. It is for the National Court to verify in each individual case whether that condition is satisfied. And then uh, they give the answer that they give in 13, and that finds its way into the 2001 Brussels uh, regulation, and then ultimately in 2007 into the Convention. Cal Felis does not directly address the question which arises in this case, because there were no other collected claims uh, which would in any event be proceeding elsewhere in Calphalus. But its reasoning is entirely consistent, we submit, with the approach that was adopted by the judge in our case. Because it makes clear that the object of Article 6, the purpose <coughs> for which the principle of Article 2, suing the defendant in their state of domicile, is derogated from in Article 6, it makes clear that that purpose is the avoidance of irreconcilable judgments between member states. And that is the object to which the judge's approach gives effect and to which Piff's approach would frustrate. <coughs> so that's Cal Felis. It does not support, for the reasons I submitted, what my learned friend seeks to draw from it. And following the decision in it, the language of Article 6 was, as you know, expanded to introduce, uh, in 2001, to introduce the wording with which we're presently uh, concerned. And that introduction occurred at the same time as the introduction in the Judgments Regulation 2001 of a number of recitals. And it's worth just having a look at a couple of them. 
That is in bundle six of the authorities uh, at tab uh, 1860. I'm so sorry, at tab 56. Uh, uh, and we can look at two of them, recitals 12 and 15, which the learned judge also referred to, uh, at page 1860. Recital 12 in the left hand column. Where does the judge refer to them? Uh, we will get the answer to your ladyship's you. question. Um, uh, in addition to the defendant's domicile, there should be alternative grounds of jurisdiction based on a close link between the court and the action, ir or in order to facilitate the sound administration of justice. And one should, as it were, mentally underline that. And then 15, in the interests of the harmonious administration of justice, it is necessary to minimise the possibility of concurrent proceedings and to ensure the irre that irreconcilable judgments will not be given in two member states. There must be a clear and effective mechanism for resolving cases of leave pendants and related actions and from, for obviating problems flowing uh, from national differences as to the determination of the time when a case is regarded as pending, uh, uh, etc. For the purposes of the regulation, that time should be defined autonomous. Paragraph 413. <coughs> 413. Uh, yes, you, you, my lady, yes. And those two recitals were also picked up in uh, a, a decision which the judge also referred to in a round about the same place of Pénier, if that's how one pronounces it, which we should also look at because, again, they underscore this. In fact, your ladyship, I think, picked up the quotation, the uh, judge's quotation from this case uh, uh, earlier, earlier on, it's at 423 of the judgment, uh, and uh, it's in bundle five of the authorities at tab 46, page 1570, the passage that I want to draw your attention to, and it's paragraph 77. Sorry, can you give me the tab number? Again? It's tab, uh, tab 46. Page 1570, uh, and this is a judgment of the Court of Justice. The facts I don't matter, uh, but it's what the court says at paragraph 77 when talking about the purpose of Article 6 1. As regards its purpose, the rule of jurisdiction in Article 6 1 of this case, the judgment's regulation, first meets in accordance with recitals 12 and 15 in the preamble to that regulation, which we've just looked at. Uh, the wish to facilitate the sound administration of justice, to minimise the possibility of concurrent proceedings and thus to avoid irreconcilable outcomes if cases are decided separately. So again, as the judge rightly cited and, as the, uh, and decided, and as this case makes clear, the object is the avoidance of irreconcilable judgments between member states. So stepping back, if one asks what is the purpose of the derogation provided by Article 6.1 from the basic principle that a defendant is to be sued in their jurisdiction of domicile, the answer we submit is both clear and consistent. That purpose has been stated to be consistently in order to facilitate the sound administration of justice, and in particular, the avoidance of irreconcilable judgments between the member states. It is entirely in accordance with that purpose, we submit, that when considering whether the claim against an anchor defendant and that against the target defendant are so closely connected <coughs> that it is expedient to hear and determine them together to avoid the risk of irreconcilable judgments. The court should take into account the existence of other more closely connected claims against the target defendant in its state of domicile and the fact that if jurisdiction were accepted, it would give rise to a greater risk of more irreconcilable judgments between member states than if jurisdiction is refused. Indeed, to leave such matters out of account, would be to enable Article 6.1 to be used to derogate from the basic principle that a defendant is to be sued in their state of domicile in a way which would frustrate rather than further 
the purpose for which that derogation is permitted by the article. And that is exactly what the judge found, having considered these authorities, as your lordship and your ladyships have seen, <coughs> at paragraph 431 of his judgment. So that is the second point. We've got language, we've got purpose of the article. The third point... And sorry, somewhere, have you already dealt with it, and I just need to go back over it, but have you dealt with the point about um, it has to be present for already existing proceedings? Uh, I will do... I've dealt with it in passing, yes. because I've made the point about the exercise is necessarily always going to be a hypothetical one, which will require you to consider a yes, hypothetical yes. counterfactual. Yes, I see. But there is a set further point as well, right. which is that if my learned friend is right about that, then Lord Justice Longmore is wrong. Uh, and uh, indeed, Lord Justice Longmore and the rest in of the, the Court of Appeal, which the case, the case is going to come to you shortly, right, uh, of Alfred Laval. Uh, <coughs> uh, and so that forms part of my third point, which is how have the courts approached the question of uh, the application, sorry, of the Article 6 <coughs> on taste test in practice. Now, the judge was concerned with this point in the context of a submission made by PIFs that Aeroflot was determinative of this issue. Indeed, it's a submission which is repeated before your lordship and your ladyship. But before one gets to Aeroflot, and before I uh, attempt at least to persuade you that that submission is flawed, uh, there are three sets of other authorities which touch on the correct approach uh, and which the, with which the judge's approach was entirely consistent. Now, uh, he did not have all of those authorities, for which I suppose all of us on this side of the bench uh, bear responsibility, um, but happily the conclusion that he reached is entirely consistent with those cases. He had the first one and he referred to it in his judgment, and that's the decision of the Court of Justice in Freeport and Arnolston. Now, that's not actually a case which is on for all fours with our case because it didn't uh, concern uh, as it were, other sets of connected proceedings elsewhere. Uh, but there was some general guidance given for how the National Court should approach the application of the test in Article 6.1. You were shown it, but let's just look at it again if we, if we could. It's at Authorities Bundle 5, Tab 44. Questions that were referred uh, to the Court of Justice don't uh, particularly matter for your note there at page 1496. Um, uh, what matters is what the Court said uh, uh, at paragraph 41 of page 1502. You've seen this already, but if you'll forgive me, I just want to look at it again. Uh, it is for the National Court to assess whether there is a connection between the different claims brought before it that is to say, a risk of irreconcilable judgments if those claims were determined separately, and in that regard, to take account of all the necessary factors in the case file, which may, if appropriate, yet without being, its being necessary for the assessment, uh, lead, lead it to take into consideration the legal basis of the action brought before the court. <coughs> now, my learned friend uh, said fairly that we take, we place reliance on the phrase to take account of all the necessary factors in the court file. And indeed, we do, because what that suggests is an, commonsensically, we would suggest, expansive approach to the evaluation of what is or is not expedient. Uh, but one well, doesn't want to overstate the position, uh, but it is certainly approach, an approach, we would suggest, which is consistent uh, with taking into account all appropriate factors which make it expedient to try the claim against the target defendant at the same time as the claims against the anchor defendant, including the existence of other more closely connected proceedings likely to give rise to a greater risk of irreconcilable judgments in the jurisdiction of the, anchor def of the target defendant's domicile. As I say, one can't place too much reliance on that, uh, but insofar as it goes, it goes in our direction, we say. The next authority is the decision of this court in research in motion, which is... Um, is the second set of authorities or part of the Freeport set? 
This is the second. Uh, the, the, there's Freeport, there's Research in Motion, and then there's two decisions in Alpha Laval, the decision of Briggs J, as he then was at first instance, and then uh, of this court. Uh, uh, research in Motion is at tab, uh, bundle one, tab five. It is a case which was concerned with Article 28 of the Judgments Regulation, which of course is the Lee's Alibi Pendens provision. But it contains, as you I'm sure now know, the same wording uh, as the particular part of the wording of Article 6.1 with which we are concerned. <coughs> and Lord Justice Mummery, giving the judgment of the Court of Appeal, addressed the proper approach to applying uh, the Article 28 test, and therefore that language, uh, at paragraphs 37 and 38 of his judgment, which are at page 74. Uh, uh, and uh, this is what he said. I'll um, try and skip it uh, so far as I can. Um, <coughs> the act, just starting midway through, start at the first sentence of paragraph 37. The application of... Uh, However, that is you not the result to, of the application. You want us to read any of this, or are you just get to... Yes, uh, yes. Uh, and in, uh, uh, why don't you, if you would, read paragraph 37. Yes. And the last five, six, seven lines... Well, 37 is yes. important, isn't it? Paragraph 37 is very important. In the context um, of the debate we've been having. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what I'll do, if I may, is read paragraph 37 and the last bit of paragraph 38. The result of the application of Article 28... We, we, we can read it to ourselves. I'll leave it, I'll leave it to you. Yes. So your Lordship and your Ladyships will immediately appreciate the importance of paragraph 37 and the latter part of paragraph 38 and in particular the two important points which are to be taken from this passage of the Lord Justice's judgment which although they're articulated in the context of article 28 are no less applicable in the context of article where do we see the seven. wording of article 28 please? article 28 uh, oh, sorry. Sorry. Yes, I'm just oh, yes. thank you sorry Yes, page five, page seventy-six of the bundle. Thank you. Ah, oh, yes, thank you. Uh, Subparagraph three, mm -hmm. so closely connected, da 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 da, is the same language as the bit of Article six mm -hmm. with which we're concerned. And the two points that I want to take from Lord Justice Mummery's judgment is that first, what is involved is not simply a mechanical assessment of the degree of connection in the context of Article 28 at least between the claim sought to be stayed and the claim in favour of which the stay is, the stay is stored, sought, which is the Article 28 context. It also involves a value judgment, to use the Lord Justice's words, a value judgment as to the exper expediency of hearing the two actions together in order to avoid the risk of inconsistent judgment. And the second point is that it's not the case that the mere existence of a possibility of inconsistent judgments between those two claims requires a state to be granted. As the Lord Justice said, one has to consider the question of expediency. One has to consider expediency. So that's an important decision in the context, obviously, of Article 28, but also, we say, of Article 6. And the next uh, decision that I... Uh, set of decisions I want to take you to, uh, the Alpha Laval decisions at first instance and on appeal. Uh, so far as the first instance decision is concerned, this is in bundle 1, tab 11, uh, the authorities, uh, and uh, the, the facts of this case are of some importance. In fact, they're of considerable importance. So I want to take a little time, if I may, just to uh, state them. The claimant 
brought claims for breach of confidence in England against a company, SSI, and an individual, Mr Pacey, both of whom were domiciled in England. SSI went into administration and the claim against it was settled. Mr Pacey was committed for contempt and nothing of note further happened in the action against him. The claimant then applied to join two further defendants, a company called SSIP and an individual called Mr Jazikowski, each of whom was domiciled in Poland. The application was made, amongst other things, under Article 6.1, in this case of the Judgments Regulation, so it's in identical terms to the Convention. The Polish individual, Mr Jazikowski, was a former employee of one of the claimants, and a key issue in the application was whether he had to be sued in Poland by virtue of Articles 18 and 20 of the Judgments Regulation, which mandate that in matters relating to individual contracts of employment, the employer must bring proceedings only in courts in the courts of the employee's state of domicile. So those are the facts. And Mr Justice Briggs, as he then was, determined that Articles 18 and 20 were not engaged, and therefore that Mr Jazikowski did not have to be sued in Poland. And having made that finding, he then found that the claim is against the two Polish defendants, Mr Jazikowski and SSIP, satisfied the test set out in Article 6.1 so that they could be pursued in England. Now, those findings were reversed on appeal in a way which is of very considerable importance to our case. But let us start with the decision of Briggs J, which we can pick up uh, in a page um, uh, in the judgment, forgive me, at uh, tab, si uh, tab 11, uh, and it's paragraphs at uh, page 238 of the bundle of paragraphs uh, 32 to 34 of the judgment. And if you're, you don't need to read beyond the first sentence of 34, but if you would just read or glance at least through 32 and 33 and the first sentence. So you will see from that that so far as Mr Justice Briggs was concerned, what had been said by Lord Justice Mummery in the context of Article 28 was apposite and applicable in the context of Article 6. Now, what happened in the Court of Appeal, we can see from the judgment in the same bundle at tab 12, principal judgment was delivered by, as you know, Lord Justice Longmore, with whom uh, Lord uh, or Justice Davis and the Chancellor agreed, and the court reached a different conclusion from the conclusion that Briggs J had reached as to whether the claims against Mr. Jazikowski, the Polish employee, had to be proceeded with in Poland by reason of Articles 18 and 20 of the Judgments Regulation. The Court of Appeal concluded that those claims did have to be proceeded with against Mr. Jazikowski in Poland, his state of domicile, by operation of those provisions. In our case, we have Article 23 causing claims to be brought in Switzerland. In this case, we have Articles 18 and 20 causing claims to have to be brought in Poland. The claims were not extant at the time of this decision, but the judge concluded that they would be brought and they would have to be brought in Poland. Now, the important point is what the learned Lord Justice then went on to consider and find when, against that backdrop, he applied the Article 6.1 test to the application to take jurisdiction over SSIP, which was also domiciled in Poland. And uh, we can pick up how he approached the matter from, I think, if your Lordship and your Ladyship would, read from the beginning of paragraph 33 uh, down to the end of paragraph 37. It's a long 
passage, but I, I, I fear it is a very important passage in the context of this case. And the critical paragraph is 36. So y you will see the uh, point, uh, and you will also see uh, that it is obvious that Lord Justice Murray's approach, this court's approach, and the reasoning in his judgment cannot be reconciled with the interpretation of Article 6.1, for which my learned friend contends. It is entirely consistent, however, with the approach which the judge adopted in this case. It is clear, in particular, <coughs> that when applying the test in Article 6.1, Lord Justice Mummery did not confine his field of review to the claims against the anchor defendant, Mr Pacey, and the target defendant, SSIP. Sorry, Lord, Lord Longmore. I'm so sorry. Lord Justice I'm Longmore. So, I'm so, I do apologise. Lord Justice Longmore. Yes. It's an error in my notes. Uh, it is clear that Lord Justice Monmore did not confine his field of review to the claims against the anchor defendant, Mr. Pacey, and the target defendant, SSIP. He took into account the likely fact, and I emphasize likely fact. Yes, I think we, we see that in yeah. paragraph 26. In paragraph 26. And, and your Lordship will see immediately the obvious parallels with this case. Um, and I would just add one further point to the obvious ones, if I may, which is that although it's not stated in terms in Lord Justice Longmore's judgment, it is a fair inference, we would suggest, from his reasoning, and in particular his reference to the dormant state of the case against Mr Pacey in England, that he considered that the risk of irreconcilable judgments was less if the claimants were required to pursue SICIP in Poland, where Mr. Jasikowski was to be sued, rather than in England, where there was every prospect, if SSIP was not joined, that the action against Mr. Pacey would remain dormant and wither on the vine. So the decision of this court, uh, as a final submission today, in Alpha Laval, is irreconcilable with Piff's case, and it is consistent entirely with the approach which the judge adopted. Now, uh, that brings me to air of plot, which I can address relatively briefly in the morning. Um, uh, one needs to How long will you need in the morning to complete your submission? I think I will need, uh, I would, I would hope no more than 15 minutes and probably rather less. All right, well, if that um, can be accommodated with, um, with other parties, um, so be it. All right, we'll start again at 10 o'clock. Of course. <clears throat>